Section one of Tales of a Wayside Inn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Yearsley. Tales of a Wayside Inn by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Section one. Prelude. The Wayside Inn. One autumn night in Sudbury Town, across the meadows, bare and brown, the windows of the wayside inn gleamed red with firelight through the leaves of woodbine hanging from the eaves, their crimson curtains rent and thin. As ancient is this hostelry as any in the land may be, built in the old colonial day when men lived in a grander way, with ampler hospitality. A kind of old hobgoblin hall, now somewhat fallen to decay, with weather stains upon the wall, and stairways worn, and crazy doors, and creaking and uneven floors, and chimneys huge and tiled and tall. A region of repose, it seems, a place of slumber and of dreams, remote among the wooded hills. For there no noisy railway speeds, its torch race scattering smoke and gleeds, but noon and night the panting teams stop under the great oaks that throw tangles of light and shade below, on roofs and doors and window sills. Across the road the barns display their lines of stalls, their mows of hay. Through the wide doors the breezes blow. The wattled cocks strut to and fro, and, half effaced by rain and shine, the red horse prances on the sign. Round this old-fashioned quaint abode, deep silence reigned, save when a gust went rushing down the county road, and skeletons of leaves and dust, a moment quickened by its breath, shuddered and danced their dance of death, and through the ancient oaks o'erhead. Mysterious voices moaned and fled. But from the parlour of the inn A pleasant murmur smote the ear, Like water rushing through a weir, Oft interrupted by the din of laughter And of loud applause, And in each intervening pause The music of a violin, The firelight shedding over all The splendour of its ruddy glow, Filled the whole parlour large and low, It gleamed on wainscot and on wall, it touched, with more than wonted grace, Fair Princess Mary's pictured face. It bronzed the rafters overhead, On the old spinet's ivory keys It played inaudible melodies. It crowned the sombre clock with flame, The hands, the hours, the maker's name, And painted with a livelier red The landlord's coat of arms again. And, flashing on the window-pane, Emblazoned with its light and shade, the jovial rhymes that still remain writ nearly a century ago by the great Major Molyneux, whom Hawthorne has immortal made. Before the blazing fire of wood erect the rapt musician stood, and ever and anon he bent his head upon his instrument, and seemed to listen, till he caught confessions of its secret thought, the joy, the triumph, the lament the exultation and the pain. Then, by the magic of his art, he soothed the throbbings of its heart, and lulled it into peace again. Around the fireside, at their ease, there sat a group of friends, entranced with the delicious melodies, who from the far-off noisy town had to the wayside inn come down to rest beneath its old oak trees. The firelight on their faces glanced, Their shadows on the wainscot danced, And though of different lands and speech, Each had his tale to tell, And each was anxious to be pleased and please. And while the sweet musician plays, Let me in outline sketch them all, Perchance uncouthly, as the blaze With its uncertain touch Portrays their shadowy semblance on the wall. But first the landlord will I trace, Grave in his aspect and attire, A man of ancient pedigree, A justice of the peace was he, Known in all Sudbury as the squire. Proud was he of his name and race, Of old Sir William and Sir Hugh, And in the parlour full in view 
his coat of arms well framed and glazed upon the wall in colours blazed he beareth gules upon his shield a chevron argent in the field with three wolf's heads and for the crest a wyvern part per pale addressed upon a helmet barred below the scroll reads by the name of how and over this no longer bright though glimmering with a latent light was hung the sword his grandsire bore in the rebellious days of yore down there at concord in the fight a youth was there of quiet ways a student of old books and days to whom all tongues and lands were known and yet a lover of his own with many a social virtue graced and yet a friend of solitude a man of such a genial mood the heart of all things he embraced and yet of such fastidious taste he never found the best too good books were his passion and delight and in his upper room at home stood many a rare and sumptuous tome in vellum bound with gold bedight great volumes garmented in white recalling florence pisa rome he loved the twilight that surrounds the borderland of old romance where glitter hauberk helm and lance and banner waves and trumpet sounds and ladies ride with hawk on wrist and mighty warriors sweep along magnified by the purple mist the dust of centuries and of song the chronicles of charlemagne of merlin and the mort d'arthur mingled together in his brain with tales of flores and blanche fleur sir ferumbras sir eglamour sir launcelot sir morgador sir guy sir bevis sir gawain a young sicilian too was there in sight of etna born and bred some breath of its volcanic air was glowing in his heart and brain and being rebellious to his liege after palermo's fatal siege across the western seas he fled in good king bomba's happy reign his face was like a summer night all flooded with a dusky light his hands were small his teeth shone white as sea-shells when he smiled or spoke his sinews supple and strong as oak clean-shaven was he as a priest who at the mass on sunday sings save that upon his upper lip his beard a good palm's length at least level and pointed at the tip shot sideways like a swallow's wings the poets read he o'er and o'er and most of all the immortal four of italy and next to those the story-telling bard of prose who wrote the joyous tuscan tales of the decameron that make fiesole's green hills and vales remembered for boccaccio's sake much too of music was his thought the melodies and measures fraught with sunshine and the open air of vineyards and the singing sea of his beloved sicily and much it pleased him to peruse the songs of the sicilian muse bucolic songs by mele sung in the familiar peasant tongue that made men say behold once more the pitying gods to earth restore theocritus of syracuse a spanish jew from alicant with aspect grand and grave was there vendor of silks and fabrics rare and attar of rose from the levant like an old patriarch he appeared abraham or isaac or at least some later prophet or high priest with lustrous eyes and olive skin and wildly tossed from cheeks and chin the tumbling cataract of his beard his garments breathed a spicy scent of cinnamon and sandal blent like the soft aromatic gales that meet the mariner who sails through the moluccas and the seas that wash the shores of celebes all stories that recorded are by pierre alphonse he knew by heart and it was rumoured he could say the parables of sandabar and all the fables of pilpay or if not all the greater part well versed was he in hebrew books talmud and targum and the law of kabbalah and evermore there was a mystery in his looks his eyes seemed gazing far away as if in vision or in trance he heard the solemn sackbut play and saw the jewish maidens dance 
a theologian from the school of cambridge on the charles was there skilful alike with tongue and pen he preached to all men everywhere the gospel of the golden rule the new commandment given to men thinking the deed and not the creed would help us in our utmost need with reverent feet the earth he trod nor banished nature from his plan but studied still with deep research to build the universal church lofty as is the love of god and ample as the wants of man a poet too was there whose verse was tender musical and terse the inspiration the delight the gleam the glory the swift flight of thoughts so sudden that they seem the revelations of a dream all these were his but with them came no envy of another's fame he did not find his sleep less sweet for music in some neighbouring street nor rustling here in every breeze the laurels of miltiades honour and blessings on his head while living good report when dead who not too eager for renown accepts but does not clutch the crown last the musician as he stood illumined by that fire of wood fair-haired blue-eyed his aspect blithe his figure tall and straight and lithe and every feature of his face revealing his norwegian race a radiance streaming from within around his eyes and forehead beamed the angel with the violin painted by raphael he seemed he lived in that ideal world whose language is not speech but song around him evermore the throng of elves and sprites their dances whirled the stromkarl sang the cataract hurled its headlong waters from the height and mingled in the wild delight the scream of sea-birds in their flight the rumour of the forest trees the plunge of the implacable seas the tumult of the wind at night voices of eld like trumpets blowing old ballads and wild melodies through mist and darkness pouring forth like Eli Vega's river flowing out of the glaciers of the north the instrument on which he played was in cremona's workshops made by a great master of the past ere yet was lost the art divine fashioned of maple and of pine that in tyrolean forests vast had rocked and wrestled with the blast exquisite was it in design perfect in each minutest part a marvel of the lutist's art and in its hollow chamber thus the maker from whose hands it came had written his unrivalled name antonius stradivarius and when he played the atmosphere was filled with magic and the ear caught echoes of that harp of gold whose music had so weird a sound the hunted stag forgot to bound the leaping rivulet backward rolled the birds came down from bush and tree the dead came from beneath the sea the maiden to the harper's knee the music ceased the applause was loud the pleased musician smiled and bowed the wood fire clapped its hands of flame the shadows on the wainscot stirred and from the harpsichord there came a ghostly murmur of acclaim a sound like that sent down at night by birds of passage in their flight from the remotest distance heard then silence followed then began a clamour for the landlord's tale the story promised them of old they said but always left untold and he although a bashful man and all his courage seemed to fail finding excuse of no avail yielded and thus the story ran the landlord's tale paul revere's ride listen my children and you shall hear of the midnight ride of paul revere on the eighteenth of april in seventy five hardly a man is now alive who remembers that famous day and year he said to his friend if the british march by land or sea from the town to-night hang a lantern aloft in the belfry arch of the north church tower as a signal light one if by land and two if by sea and i on the opposite shore will be ready to ride and spread the alarm through every middlesex village and farm for the country folk to be up and to arm then he said good-night and with muffled oar 
silently rowed to the Charlestown shore, just as the moon rose over the bay, where swinging wide at her moorings lay the Somerset, British man of war, a phantom ship, with each mast and spar across the moon like a prison bar, and a huge black bulk that was magnified by its own reflection in the tide. Meanwhile his friend, through alley and street, wanders and watches with eager ears, till in the silence around him he hears the muster of men at the barrack door, the sound of arms and the tramp of feet, and the measured tread of the grenadiers marching down to their boats on the shore. Then he climbed to the tower of the church, up the wooden stairs with stealthy tread, to the belfry chamber overhead, and startled the pigeons from their perch on the sombre rafters that round him made masses and moving shapes of shade. Up the trembling ladder, steep and tall, to the highest window in the wall, where he paused to listen, and look down a moment on the roofs of the town, and the moonlight flowing over all. Beneath, in the churchyard, lay the dead, in their night encampment on the hill, wrapped in silence so deep and still that he could hear, like a sentinel's tread, the watchful night wind as it went creeping along from tent to tent, and seeming to whisper, All is well. A moment only he feels the spell of the place and the hour, and the secret dread of the lonely belfry and the dead, for suddenly all his thoughts are bent on a shadowy something far away, where the river widens to meet the bay, a line of black that bends and floats on the rising tide, like a bridge of boats. Meanwhile, impatient to mount and ride, booted and spurred, with a heavy stride, on the opposite shore walked Paul Revere. Now he patted his horse's side, now gazed at the landscape far and near. Then impetuous stamped the earth, and turned and tightened his saddle girth. But mostly he watched, with eager search, the belfry tower of the old North Church, as it rose above the graves on the hill, lonely and spectral and sombre and still. And lo, as he looks, on the belfry's height, a glimmer and then a gleam of light, he springs to the saddle, the bridle he turns, but lingers and gazes, till full on his sight a second lamp in the belfry burns. A hurry of hoofs in a village street, a shape in the moonlight, a bulk in the dark, and beneath, from the pebbles, in passing, a spark, struck out by a steed flying fearless and fleet. That was all, and yet through the gloom and the light, the fate of a nation was riding that night. And the spark struck out by that steed, in his flight, kindled the land into flame with its heat. He has left the village, and mounted the steep, and beneath him, tranquil and broad and deep, is the mystic, meeting the ocean tides, and under the alders that skirt its edge, now soft on the sand, now loud on the ledge, is heard the tramp of his steed as he rides. It was twelve by the village clock when he crossed the bridge into Medford town. He heard the crowing of the cock, and the barking of the farmer's dog, and felt the damp of the river fog that rises after the sun goes down. It was one by the village clock when he galloped into Lexington. He saw the gilded weathercock swim in the moonlight as he passed, and the meeting-house windows, blank and bare, gaze at him with a spectral glare, as if they already stood aghast at the bloody work they would look upon. It was two by the village clock when he came to the bridge in Concord town. He heard the bleating of the flock and the twitter of birds among the trees and felt the breath of the morning breeze blowing over the meadows brown. And one was safe and asleep in his bed, who at the bridge would be first to fall, who that day would be lying dead, pierced by a British musket ball. You know the rest. In the books you have read, how the British regulars fired and fled, how the farmers gave them ball for ball, from behind each fence and farmyard wall chasing the redcoats down the lane, then crossing the fields to emerge again under the trees at the turn of the road, and only pausing to fire and load. So through the night rode Paul Revere, and so through the night went his cry of alarm to every Middlesex village and farm, a cry of defiance and not of fear, a voice in the darkness, a knock at the door, 
and a word that shall echo for evermore for born on the night wind of the past through all our history to the last in the hour of darkness and peril and need the people will waken and listen to hear the hurrying hoofbeats of that steed and the midnight message of paul revere interlude the landlord ended thus his tale then rising took down from its nail the sword that hung there dim with dust and cleaving to its sheath with rust and said this sword was in the fight the poet seized it and exclaimed it is the sword of a good knight though homespun was his coat of mail what matter if it be not named joyeuse collada durindale excalibur or arondite or other name the books record your ancestor who bore this sword as colonel of the volunteers mounted upon his old grey mare seen here and there and everywhere to me a grander shape appears than old sir william or what not clinking about in foreign lands with iron gauntlets on his hands and on his head an iron pot all laughed the landlord's face grew red as his escutcheon on the wall he could not comprehend at all the drift of what the poet said for those who had been longest dead were always greatest in his eyes and he was speechless with surprise to see sir william's plumed head brought to a level with the rest and made the subject of a jest and this perceiving to appease the landlord's wrath the other's fears the student said with careless ease the ladies and the cavaliers the arms the loves the courtesies the deeds of high emprise i sing thus ariosto says in words that have the stately stride and ring of armed knights and clashing swords now listen to the tale i bring listen though not to me belong the flowing draperies of his song the words that rouse the voice that charms the landlord's tale was one of arms only a tale of love is mine blending the human and divine a tale of the decameron told in palmieri's garden old by fiametta laurel crowned while her companions lay around and heard the intermingled sound of airs that on their errands sped and wild birds gossiping overhead and lisp of leaves and fountains fall and her own voice more sweet than all telling the tale which wanting these perchance may lose its power to please end of section 1section 2 of tales of a wayside inn this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by peter yearsley tales of a wayside inn by henry wadsworth longfellow section 2 the student's tale the falcon of ser federigo one summer morning when the sun was hot weary with labour in his garden plot on a rude bench beneath his cottage eaves ser federigo sat among the leaves of a huge vine that with its arms outspread hung its delicious clusters overhead below him through the lovely valley flowed the river arno like a winding road and from its banks were lifted high in air the spires and roofs of florence called the fair to him a marble tomb that rose above his wasted fortunes and his buried love for there in banquet and in tournament his wealth had lavished been his substance spent to woo and lose since ill his wooing sped mona giovanna who his rival wed yet ever in his fancy reigned supreme the ideal woman of a young man's dream then he withdrew in poverty and pain to this small farm the last of his domain his only comfort and his only care to prune his vines and plant the fig and pear his only forester and only guest his falcon faithful to him when the rest whose willing hands had found so light of yore the brazen knocker of his palace door had now no strength to lift the wooden latch that entrance gave beneath a roof of thatch companion of his solitary ways 
purveyor of his feasts on holidays. On him this melancholy man bestowed the love with which his nature overflowed. And so the empty-handed years went round, vacant though voiceful with prophetic sound. And so that summer morn he sat and mused with folded patient hands as he was used. And dreamily before his half-closed sight floated the vision of his lost delight. Beside him, motionless, the drowsy bird dreamed of the chase, and in his slumber heard the sudden scythe-like sweep of wings that dare the headlong plunge through eddying gulfs of air. Then, starting broad awake upon his perch, tinkled his bells like mass-bells in a church, and, looking at his master, seemed to say, Ser Federico, shall we hunt to-day? Ser Federico thought not of the chase, the tender vision of her lovely face. I will not say he seems to see, he sees in the leaf shadows of the trellises. Herself, yet not herself, a lovely child, with flowing tresses and eyes wide and wild, coming undaunted up the garden walk, and looking not at him but at the hawk. Beautiful falcon, said he, would that I might hold thee on my wrist, or see thee fly. The voice was hers, and made strange echoes start through all the haunted chambers of his heart, as an aeolian harp through gusty doors of some old ruin its wild music pours. Who is thy mother, my fair boy? he said, his hand laid softly on that shining head. Mona Giovanna, will you let me stay a little while, and— with your falcon play. We live there, just beyond your garden wall, in the great house behind the poplars tall. So he spake on, and Federigo heard as from afar each softly uttered word, and drifted onward through the golden gleams and shadows of the misty sea of dreams, as mariners be calmed through vapours drift, and feel the sea beneath them sink and lift and hear far off the mournful breakers roar, and voices calling faintly from the shore. Then, waking from his pleasant reveries, he took the little boy upon his knees, and told him stories of his gallant bird, till, in their friendship, he became a third. Mona Giovanna, widowed in her prime, had come with friends to pass the summer-time in her grand villa, half-way up the hill o'erlooking florence but retired and still with iron gates that opened through long lines of sacred ilex and centennial pines and terraced gardens and broad steps of stone and sylvan deities with moss o'ergrown and fountains palpitating in the heat and all valdarno stretched beneath its feet here in seclusion as a widow may the lovely lady wiled the hours away, Pacing in sable robes the statued hall, Herself the stateliest statue among all, And seeing more and more with secret joy Her husband risen and living in her boy, Till the lost sense of life returned again, Not as delight, but as relief from pain. Meanwhile the boy, rejoicing in his strength, Stormed down the terraces from length to length, the screaming peacock chased in hot pursuit, and climbed the garden trellises for fruit. But his chief pastime was to watch the flight of a gare falcon soaring into sight, beyond the trees that fringed the garden wall, then downward stooping at some distant call. And as he gazed, full often wondered he, who might the master of the falcon be? Until that happy morning, when he found master and falcon in the cottage ground. And now a shadow and a terror fell on the great house, as if a passing bell tolled from the tower, and filled each spacious room with secret awe and preternatural gloom. The petted boy grew ill, and day by day pined with mysterious malady away. The mother's heart would not be comforted, her darling seemed to her already dead, and often sitting by the sufferer's side, "'What can I do to comfort thee?' she cried. 
at first the silent lips made no reply but moved at length by her importunate cry give me he answered with imploring tone ser federigo's falcon for my own no answer could the astonished mother make how could she ask even for her darling's sake such favour at a luckless lover's hand well knowing that to ask was to command well knowing what all falconers confessed in all the land that falcon was the best the master's pride and passion and delight and the sole pursuivant of this poor knight but yet for her child's sake she could no less than give assent to soothe his restlessness so promised and then promising to keep her promise sacred saw him fall asleep the morrow was a bright september morn the earth was beautiful as if new-born there was that nameless splendour everywhere that wild exhilaration in the air which makes the passers in the city street congratulate each other as they meet two lovely ladies clothed in cloak and hood passed through the garden gate into the wood under the lustrous leaves and through the sheen of dewy sunshine showering down between the one close hooded had the attractive grace which sorrow sometimes lends a woman's face her dark eyes moistened with the mists that roll from the gulf stream of passion in the soul the other with her hood thrown back her hair making a golden glory in the air her cheeks suffused with an auroral blush her young heart singing louder than the thrush so walked that morn through mingled light and shade each by the other's presence lovelier maid mona giovanna and her bosom friend intent upon their errand and its end they found ser federigo at his toil like banished adam delving in the soil and when he looked and these fair women spied the garden suddenly was glorified his long-lost eden was restored again and the strange river winding through the plain no longer was the arno to his eyes but the euphrates watering paradise mona giovanna raised her stately head and with fair words of salutation said ser federigo we come here as friends hoping in this to make some poor amends for past unkindness i who ne'er before would even cross the threshold of your door i who in happier days such pride maintained refused your banquets and your gifts disdained this morning come a self-invited guest to put your generous nature to the test and breakfast with you under your own vine to which he answered poor desert of mine not your unkindness call it for if aught is good in me of feeling or of thought from you it comes and this last grace outweighs all sorrows all regrets of other days and after further compliment and talk among the dahlias in the garden walk he left his guests and to his cottage turned and as he entered for a moment yearned for the lost splendours of the days of old the ruby glass the silver and the gold and felt how piercing is the sting of pride by want embittered and intensified he looked about him for some means or way to keep this unexpected holiday searched every cupboard and then searched again summoned the maid who came but came in vain the signor did not hunt to-day she said there's nothing in the house but wine and bread then suddenly the drowsy falcon shook his little bells with that sagacious look which said as plain as language to the ear if anything is wanting i am here yes everything is wanting gallant bird the master seized thee without further word like thine own lure he whirled thee round ah oh, me the pomp and flutter of brave falconry the bells the jesses the bright scarlet hood the flight and the pursuit o'er field and wood all these for evermore are ended now no longer victor but the victim thou then on the board a snow-white cloth he spread laid on its wooden dish the loaf of bread 
brought purple grapes with autumn sunshine hot the fragrant peach the juicy bergamot then in the midst a flask of wine he placed and with autumnal flowers the banquet graced ser federigo would not these suffice without thy falcon stuffed with cloves and spice when all was ready and the courtly dame with her companion to the cottage came upon ser federigo's brain there fell the wild enchantment of a magic spell the room they entered mean and low and small was changed into a sumptuous banquet hall with fanfares by aerial trumpets blown the rustic chair she sat on was a throne he ate celestial food and a divine flavour was given to his country wine and the poor falcon fragrant with his spice a peacock was or bird of paradise when the repast was ended they arose and passed again into the garden close then said the lady far too well i know remembering still the days of long ago though you betray it not with what surprise you see me here in this familiar wise you have no children and you cannot guess what anguish what unspeakable distress a mother feels whose child is lying ill nor how her heart anticipates his will and yet for this you see me lay aside all womanly reserve and check of pride and ask the thing most precious in your sight your falcon your sole comfort and delight which if you find it in your heart to give my poor unhappy boy perchance may live ser federigo listens and replies with tears of love and pity in his eyes alas dear lady there can be no task so sweet to me as giving when you ask one little hour ago if i had known this wish of yours it would have been my own but thinking in what manner i could best do honour to the presence of my guest i deemed that nothing worthier could be than what most dear and precious was to me and so my gallant falcon breathed his last to furnish forth this morning our repast in mute contrition mingled with dismay the gentle lady turned her eyes away grieving that he such sacrifice should make and kill his falcon for a woman's sake yet feeling in her heart a woman's pride that nothing she could ask for was denied then took her leave and passed out at the gate with footsteps slow and soul disconsolate three days went by and lo a passing bell tolled from the little chapel in the dell ten strokes ser federigo heard and said breathing a prayer alas her child is dead three months went by and lo a merrier chime rang from the chapel bells at christmas time the cottage was deserted and no more ser federigo sat beside its door but now with servitors to do his will in the grand villa half way up the hill sat at the christmas feast and at his side mona giovanna his beloved bride never so beautiful so kind so fair enthroned once more in the old rustic chair high perched upon the back of which there stood the image of a falcon carved in wood and underneath the inscription with a date all things come round to him who will but wait interlude soon as the story reached its end one over eager to command crowned it with injudicious praise and then the voice of blame found vent and fanned the embers of dissent into a somewhat lively blaze the theologian shook his head these old italian tales he said from the much praised decameron down through all the rabble of the rest are either trifling dull or lewd the gossip of a neighbourhood in some remote provincial town a scandalous chronicle at best they seem to me a stagnant fen grown rank with rushes and with reeds where a white lily now and then blooms in the midst of noxious weeds and deadly nightshade on its banks to this the student straight replied for the white lily many thanks 
one should not say with too much pride fountain i will not drink of thee nor were it grateful to forget that from these reservoirs and tanks even imperial shakespeare drew his moor of venice and the jew and romeo and juliet and many a famous comedy then a long pause till some one said an angel is flying overhead at these words spake the spanish jew and murmured with an inward breath god grant if what you say is true it may not be the angel of death and then another pause and then stroking his beard he said again this brings back to my memory a story in the talmud told that book of gems that book of gold of wonders many and manifold a tale that often comes to me and fills my heart and haunts my brain and never wearies nor grows old the spanish jews tale the legend of rabbi ben levi rabbi ben levi on the sabbath read a volume of the law in which it said no man shall look upon my face and live and as he read he prayed that god would give his faithful servant grace with mortal eye to look upon his face and yet not die then fell a sudden shadow on the page and lifting up his eyes grown dim with age he saw the angel of death before him stand holding a naked sword in his right hand rabbi ben levi was a righteous man yet through his veins a chill of terror ran with trembling voice he said what wilt thou hear the angel answered lo the time draws near when thou must die yet first by god's decree whate'er thou askest shall be granted thee replied the rabbi let these living eyes first look upon my place in paradise then said the angel come with me and look rabbi ben levi closed the sacred book and rising and uplifting his grey head give me thy sword he to the angel said lest thou shouldst fall upon me by the way the angel smiled and hastened to obey then led him forth to the celestial town and set him on the wall whence gazing down rabbi ben levi with his living eyes might look upon his place in paradise then straight into the city of the lord the rabbi leaped with the death angel's sword and through the streets there swept a sudden breath of something there unknown which men call death meanwhile the angel stayed without and cried come back to which the rabbi's voice replied no in the name of god whom i adore i swear that hence i will depart no more then all the angels cried o holy one see what the son of levi here has done the kingdom of heaven he takes by violence and in thy name refuses to go hence the lord replied my angels be not wroth did e'er the son of levi break his oath let him remain for he with mortal eye shall look upon my face and yet not die beyond the outer wall the angel of death heard the great voice and said with panting breath give me back the sword and let me go my way whereat the rabbi paused and answered nay anguish enough already has it caused among the sons of men and while he paused he heard the awful mandate of the lord resounding through the air give back the sword the rabbi bowed his head in silent prayer then said he to the dreadful angel swear no human eye shall look on it again but when thou takest away the souls of men thyself unseen and with an unseen sword thou wilt perform the bidding of the lord the angel took the sword again and swore and walks on earth unseen for evermore interlude he ended and a kind of spell upon the silent listeners fell his solemn manner and his words had touched the deep mysterious chords that vibrate in each human breast alike but not alike confessed 
the spiritual world seemed near, and close above them, full of fear, its awful adumbration passed, a luminous shadow, vague and vast. They almost feared to look, lest there, embodied from the impalpable air, they might behold the angel stand, holding the sword in his right hand. At last, but in a voice subdued, not to disturb their dreamy mood, said the Sicilian, while you spoke, telling your legend marvellous, suddenly in my memory woke the thought of one now gone from us, an old abate, meek and mild, my friend and teacher when a child, who sometimes in those days of old the legend of an angel told, which ran, if I remember, thus. End of section 2「Section 3 of Tales of a Wayside Inn – This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Yearsley. Tales of a Wayside Inn by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Section 3 – The Sicilian's Tale – King Robert of Sicily Robert of Sicily, brother of Pope Urbane and Valmond, Emperor of Alamein, apparelled in magnificent attire, with retinue of many a knight and squire, on St. John's Eve at Vespers, proudly sat, and heard the priests chant the Magnificat, and as he listened, o'er and o'er again, repeated like a burden or refrain, he caught the words, Deposuit potentes, de sede et exaltavit humiles, and slowly lifting up his kingly head, he, to a learned clerk beside him, said, What mean these words? The clerk made answer meet. He has put down the mighty from their seat, and has exalted them of low degree. Thereat King Robert muttered scornfully, Tis well that such seditious words are sung only by priests and in the Latin tongue, for unto priests and people be it known there is no power can push me from my throne and leaning back he yawned and fell asleep lulled by the chant monotonous and deep when he awoke it was already night the church was empty and there was no light save where the lamps that glimmered few and faint lighted a little space before some saint he started from his seat and gazed around but saw no living thing and heard no sound he groped towards the door, but it was locked. He cried aloud, and listened, and then knocked, and uttered awful threatenings and complaints, and imprecations upon men and saints. The sounds re-echoed from the roof and walls, as if dead priests were laughing in their stalls. At length the sexton, hearing from without the tumult of the knocking and the shout, and thinking thieves were in the house of prayer, came with his lantern, asking, Who is there? Half choked with rage, King Robert fiercely said, Open, tis I, the king, art thou afraid? The frightened sexton, muttering with a curse, This is some drunken vagabond, or worse, turned the great key, and flung the portal wide. A man rushed by him at a single stride, haggard, half-naked, without hat or cloak, who neither turned nor looked at him, nor spoke, but leaped into the blackness of the night, and vanished like a spectre from his sight. Robert of Sicily, brother of Pope Urbane and Valmond, Emperor of Alamein, despoiled of his magnificent attire, bareheaded, breathless, and besprent with mire, with sense of wrong and outrage desperate, strode on and thundered at the palace gate, rushed through the courtyard, thrusting in his rage to right and left each seneschal and page, and hurried up the broad and sounding stair, his white face ghastly in the torch's glare. From hall to hall he passed with breathless speed, voices and cries he heard, but did not heed, until at last he reached the banquet-room, blazing with light and breathing with perfume. There, on the dais, sat another king, wearing his robes, his crown, his signet-ring, 
king robert's self in features form and height but all transfigured with angelic light it was an angel and his presence there with a divine effulgence filled the air an exultation piercing the disguise though none the hidden angel recognize a moment speechless motionless amazed the throneless monarch on the angel gazed who met his looks of anger and surprise with the divine compassion of his eyes then said who art thou and why comest thou here to which king robert answered with a sneer i am the king and come to claim my own from an impostor who usurps my throne and suddenly at these audacious words up sprang the angry guests and drew their swords the angel answered with unruffled brow nay not the king but the king's jester thou henceforth shalt wear the bells and scalloped cape and for thy counsellor shalt lead an ape thou shalt obey my servants when they call and wait upon my henchmen in the hall deaf to king robert's threats and cries and prayers they thrust him from the hall and down the stairs a group of tittering pages ran before and as they opened wide the folding door his heart failed for he heard with strange alarms the boisterous laughter of the men-at-arms and all the vaulted chamber roar and ring with the mock plaudits of long live the king next morning waking with the day's first beam he said within himself it was a dream but the straw rustled as he turned his head there were the cap and bells beside his bed around him rose the bare discoloured walls close by the steeds were champing in their stalls and in the corner a revolting shape shivering and chattering sat the wretched ape it was no dream the world he loved so much had turned to dust and ashes at his touch days came and went and now returned again to sicily the old saturnian reign under the angel's governance benign the happy island danced with corn and wine and deep within the mountain's burning breast enceladus the giant was at rest meanwhile king robert yielded to his fate sullen and silent and disconsolate dressed in the motley garb that jesters wear with looks bewildered and a vacant stare close shaven above the ears as monks are shorn by courtiers mocked by pages laughed to scorn his only friend the ape his only food what others left he still was unsubdued and when the angel met him on his way and half in earnest half in jest would say sternly though tenderly that he might feel the velvet scabbard held a sword of steel art thou the king the passion of his woe burst from him in resistless overflow and lifting high his forehead he would fling the haughty answer back i am i am the king almost three years were ended when there came ambassadors of great repute and name from valmond emperor of Alamein unto king robert saying that pope urbane by letter summoned them forthwith to come on holy thursday to his city of rome the angel with great joy received his guests and gave them presents of embroidered vests and velvet mantles with rich ermine lined and rings and jewels of the rarest kind then he departed with them o'er the sea into the lovely land of italy whose loveliness was more resplendent made by the mere passing of that cavalcade with plumes and cloaks and housings and the stir of jewelled bridle and of golden spur and lo among the menials in mock state upon a piebald steed with shambling gait his cloak of fox-tails flapping in the wind the solemn ape demurely perched behind king robert rode making huge merriment in all the country towns through which they went the pope received them with great pomp and blare of bannered trumpets on st peter's square giving his benediction and embrace 
fervent and full of apostolic grace while with congratulations and with prayers he entertained the angel unawares robert the jester bursting through the crowd into their presence rushed and cried aloud i am the king look and behold in me robert your brother king of sicily this man who wears my semblance to your eyes is an impostor in a king's disguise do you not know me does no voice within answer my cry and say we are akin the pope in silence but with troubled mien gazed at the angel's countenance serene the emperor laughing said it is strange sport to keep a madman for thy fool at court and the poor baffled jester in disgrace was hustled back among the populace in solemn state the holy week went by and easter sunday gleamed upon the sky the presence of the angel with its light before the sun rose made the city bright and with new fervour filled the hearts of men who felt that christ indeed had risen again even the jester on his bed of straw with haggard eyes the unwonted splendour saw he felt within a power unfelt before and kneeling humbly on his chamber floor he heard the rushing garments of the lord sweep through the silent air ascending heavenward and now the visit ending and once more valmond returning to the danube's shore homeward the angel journeyed and again the land was made resplendent with his train flashing along the towns of italy unto salerno and from there by sea and when once more within palermo's wall and seated on the throne in his great hall he heard the angelus from convent towers as if the better world conversed with ours he beckoned to king robert to draw nigher and with a gesture bade the rest retire and when they were alone the angel said art thou the king then bowing down his head king robert crossed both hands upon his breast and meekly answered him thou knowest best my sins as scarlet are let me go hence and in some cloister's school of penitence across those stones that pave the way to heaven walk barefoot till my guilty soul is shriven the angel smiled and from his radiant face a holy light illumined all the place and through the open window loud and clear they heard the monks chant in the chapel near above the stir and tumult of the street he has put down the mighty from their seat and has exalted them of low degree and through the chant a second melody rose like the throbbing of a single string i am an angel and thou art the king king robert who was standing near the throne lifted his eyes and lo he was alone but all apparelled as in days of old with ermined mantle and with cloth of gold and when his courtiers came they found him there kneeling upon the floor absorbed in silent prayer interlude and then the blue-eyed norseman told a saga of the days of old there is said he a wondrous book of legends in the old norse tongue of the dead kings of norway legends that once were told or sung in many a smoky fireside nook of iceland in the ancient day by wandering saga man or scald heimskrimla is the volume called and he who looks may find therein the story that i now begin and in each pause the story made upon his violin he played as an appropriate interlude fragments of old norwegian tunes that bound in one the separate runes and held the mind in perfect mood entwining and encircling all the strange and antiquated rhymes with melodies of olden times as over some half-ruined wall disjointed and about to fall fresh woodbines climb and interlace and keep the loosened stones in place end of section three Section 4 of Tales of a Wayside Inn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Yearsley. 
Tales of a Wayside Inn by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, Section 4. The Musician's Tale. The Saga of King Olaf. 1. The Challenge of Thor. I am the god Thor. I am the war god. I am the thunderer. Here in my northland, my fastness and fortress, reign I for ever. Here amid icebergs rule I the nations. This is my hammer, Mjolnir the mighty. Giants and sorcerers cannot withstand it. These are the gauntlets wherewith I wield it, and hurl it afar off. This is my girdle. Whenever I brace it, strength is redoubled. The light thou beholdest streams through the heavens, in flashes of crimson, is but my red beard blown by the night wind, affrighting the nations. Jove is my brother, mine eyes are the lightning, the wheels of my chariot roll in the thunder, the blows of my hammer ring in the earthquake. Force rules the world still, has ruled it, shall rule it. Meekness is weakness, strength is triumphant. Over the whole earth still is it Thor's day. Thou art a god too, O Galilean, and thus single-handed unto the combat, gauntlet or gospel, here I defy thee. 2. King Olaf's Return and King Olaf heard the cry, saw the red light in the sky, laid his hand upon his sword as he leaned upon the railing, and his ships went sailing, sailing northward into Drontheim fjord. There he stood as one who dreamed, and the red light glanced and gleamed on the armour that he wore, and he shouted as the rifted streamers o'er him shook and shifted, I accept thy challenge, Thor! To avenge his father slain, and reconquer realm and reign, came the youthful Olaf home. Through the midnight, sailing, sailing, listening to the wild winds wailing, and the dashing of the foam. To his thoughts the sacred name of his mother, Astrid, came, and the tale she oft had told of her flight by secret passes through the mountains and morasses to the home of Hakon old. Then strange memories crowded back of Queen Gunhild's wrath and rack, and a hurried flight by sea of grim Vikings and their rapture in the sea-fight, and the capture and the life of slavery. How a stranger watched his face in the Esthonian market-place, scanned his features one by one, saying, We should know each other, I am Sigurd, Astrid's brother, thou art Olaf, Astrid's son. Then, as Queen Alogia's page, old in honours, young in age, chief of all her men-at-arms, till vague whispers, and mysterious, reached King Valdemar, the imperious, filling him with strange alarms. Then his cruisings o'er the seas, westward to the Hebrides, and to Scilly's rocky shore, and the hermit's cavern dismal, Christ's great name and rites baptismal, in the ocean's rush and roar. All these thoughts of love and strife glimmered through his lurid life, as the stars in tenser light, through the red flames o'er him trailing, as his ships went sailing, sailing northward in the summer night, Trained for either camp or court, skilful in each manly sport, young and beautiful and tall, art of warfare, craft of chases, swimming, skating, snowshoe races, excellent alike in all. When at sea with all his rowers, he along the bending oars outside of his ship could run. He the smalsaw horn ascended, and his shining shield suspended on its summit like a sun. On the ship rails he could stand, wield his sword with either hand, and at once two javelins throw. At all feasts where ale was strongest, sat the merry monarch longest. 
first to come and last to go. Norway never yet had seen one so beautiful of mien, one so royal in attire, when in arms completely furnished, harness gold inlaid and burnished, mantle like a flame of fire. Thus came Olaf to his own, when upon the night wind blown, passed that cry along the shore, and he answered while the rifted streamers o'er him shook and shifted, I accept thy challenge, Thor. 3. Thora of Rimmel Thora of Rimmel, hide me, hide me, danger and shame and death betide me, for Olaf the king is hunting me down, through field and forest, through thorp and town. Thus cried Jarl Hakon to Thora, the fairest of women. Hakon Jarl, for the love I bear thee, neither shall shame nor death come near thee, but the hiding place wherein thou must lie is the cave underneath the swine in the sty. Thus to Jarl Hakon said Thora, the fairest of women. So Hakon Jarl and his base thrall Karka crouched in the cave, than a dungeon darker, as Olaf came riding with men in mail through the forest roads into Orkadale, demanding Jarl Hakon of Thora, the fairest of women. Rich and honoured shall be whoever the head of Hakon Jarl shall dissever. Hakon heard him, and Karka, the slave, through the breathing holes of the darksome cave. Alone in her chamber wept Thora, the fairest of women. Said Karka, the crafty, I will not slay thee, for all the king's gold I will never betray thee. Then why dost thou turn so pale, O churl, and then again black as the earth? said the earl. More pale and more faithful was Thora, the fairest of women. From a dream in the night the thrall started, saying, Round my neck a gold ring King Olaf was laying, and Hakon answered, Beware of the king, he will lay round thy neck a blood-red ring. At the ring on her finger gazed Thora, the fairest of women. At daybreak slept Hakon, with sorrows encumbered, but screamed and drew up his feet as he slumbered, the thrall in the darkness plunged with his knife, and the earl awakened no more in this life. But wakeful and weeping sat Thora, the fairest of women. At Nidarholm the priests are all singing, two ghastly heads on the gibbet are swinging, one is Jarl Hakon's and one is his thrall's, and the people are shouting from windows and walls, while alone in her chamber swoons Thora, the fairest of women. 4. Queen Sigrid the Haughty Queen Sigrid the Haughty sat proud and aloft in her chamber that looked over meadow and croft. Heart's dearest, why dost thou sorrow so? The floor with tassels of fur was besprent, filling the room with their fragrant scent. She heard the birds sing, she saw the sunshine, the air of summer was sweeter than wine. Like a sword without scabbard the bright river lay, between her own kingdom and Norway. But Olaf the king had sued for her hand, the sword would be sheathed, the river be spanned. Her maidens were seated around her knee, working bright figures in tapestry, and one was singing the ancient rune of Brunhilda's love and the wrath of Gudrun, and through it and round it and over it all sounded incessant the waterfall. The queen in her hand held a ring of gold from the door of Laid's temple old. King Olaf had sent her this wedding gift, but her thoughts as arrows were keen and swift. She had given the ring to her goldsmiths twain, who smiled as they handed it back again. And Sigrid the queen, in her haughty way, said, Why do you smile, my goldsmiths, say? And they answered, O queen, if the truth must be told, the ring is of copper, and not of gold. 
the lightning flashed o'er her forehead and cheek she only murmured she did not speak if in his gifts he can faithless be there will be no gold in his love to me a footstep was heard on the outer stair and in strode king olaf with royal air he kissed the queen's hand and he whispered of love and swore to be true as the stars are above but she smiled with contempt as she answered o king will you swear it as odin once swore on the ring and the king o oh, speak not of odin to me the wife of king olaf a christian must be looking straight at the king with her level brows she said i keep true to my faith and my vows then the face of king olaf was darkened with gloom he rose in his anger and strode through the room why then should i care to have thee he said a faded old woman a heathenish jade his zeal was stronger than fear or love and he struck the queen in the face with his glove then forth from the chamber in anger he fled and the wooden stairway shook with his tread queen sigrid the haughty said under her breath this insult king olaf shall be thy death heart dearest why dost thou sorrow so five the skerry of shrieks now from all king olaf's farms his men-at-arms gathered on the eve of easter to his house at angvaldsness fast they press drinking with the royal feaster loudly through the wide-flung door came the roar of the sea upon the skerry and its thunder loud and near reached the ear mingling with their voices merry hark said olaf to his scald halfred the bald listen to that song and learn it half my kingdom would i give as i live if by such songs you would earn it for of all the runes and rhymes of all times best i like the ocean's dirges when the old harper heaves and rocks his hoary locks flowing and flashing in the surges halfred answered i am called the unappalled nothing hinders me or daunts me hearken to me then o king while i sing the great ocean song that haunts me i will hear your song sublime some other time says the drowsy monarch yawning and retires each laughing guest applauds the jest then they sleep till day is dawning pacing up and down the yard king olaf's guard saw the sea mist slowly creeping o'er the sands and up the hill gathering still round the house where they were sleeping it was not the fog he saw nor misty floor that above the landscape brooded it was avind calder's crew of warlocks blue with their caps of darkness hooded round and round the house they go weaving slow magic circles to encumber and imprison in their ring olaf the king as he helpless lies in slumber then athwart the vapours dun the easter sun streamed with one broad track of splendour in their real forms appeared the warlocks weird awful as the witch of endor blinded by the light that glared they groped and stared round about with steps unsteady from his window olaf gazed and amazed who are these strange people said he avind kelder and his men answered then from the yard a sturdy farmer while the men-at-arms apace filled the place busily buckling on their armour from the gates they sallied forth south and north scoured the island coast around them seizing all the warlock band foot and hand on the skerry's rocks they bound them and at eve the king again called his train and with all the candles burning silent sat and heard once more the sullen roar of the ocean tides returning shrieks and cries of wild despair filled the air growing fainter as they listened then the bursting surge alone sounded on thus the sorcerers were christened 
Sing, O oh Skald, your song sublime, your ocean rhyme, cried King Olaf. It will cheer me. Said the Skald with pallid cheeks, The scary of shrieks sings too loud for you to hear me. 6. THE WRAITH OF ODIN The guests were loud, the ale was strong, King Olaf feasted late and long. The hoary skalds together sang, O'erhead the smoky rafters rang, Dead rides Sir Morton of Fogelsang. The door swung wide with creak and din, A blast of cold night air came in, and on the threshold, shivering, stood a one-eyed guest with cloak and hood. Dead rides Sir Morton of Fogelsang. The king exclaimed, O oh, greybeard pale, come warn thee with this cup of ale. The foaming draught the old man quaffed, the noisy guests looked on and laughed. Dead rides Sir Morton of Fogelsang. Then spake the king, Be not afraid, sit here by me. The guest obeyed, and, seated at the table, told tales of the sea and sagas old. Dead rides Sir Morton of Fogelsang. And ever, when the tale was o'er, the king demanded yet one more, till Sigurd the bishop, smiling, said, "'Tis late, O king, and time for bed. Dead rides Sir Morton of Fogelsang. The king retired. The stranger guest followed and entered with the rest. The lights were out, the pages gone, but still the garrulous guest spake on. Dead rides Sir Morton of Fogelsang. As one who from a volume reads, he spake of heroes and their deeds, of lands and cities he had seen, and stormy gulfs that tossed between. Dead rides Sir Morton of Fogelsang. Then from his lips in music rolled the havamal of Odin old, with sounds mysterious as the roar of billows on a distant shore. Dead rides Sir Morton of Fogelsang. Do we not learn from runes and rhymes made by the gods in elder times? And do not still the great scalds teach that silence better is than speech? Dead rides Sir Morton of Fogelsang. Smiling at this, the king replied, Thy law is by thy tongue belied, For never was I so enthralled Either by sagaman or scald. Dead rides Sir Morton of Fogelsang. The bishop said, Late hours we keep. Night wanes, O king, tis time for sleep. Then slept the king, and when he woke, The guest was gone, the morning broke. Dead Rides Sir Morton of Fogelsang. They found the doors securely barred. They found the watchdog in the yard. There was no footprint in the grass, and none had seen the stranger pass. Dead rides Sir Morton of Fogelsang. King Olaf crossed himself and said, I know that Odin the Great is dead. Sure is the triumph of our faith. The one eyed stranger was his wraith. Dead rides sir morton of fogel sang end of section 4 of tales of a wayside inn section 5 of tales of a wayside inn this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by peter yearsley tales of a wayside inn by henry wadsworth longfellow section 5 the musician's tale Part seven to twelve. Part seven. Iron Beard. Olaf the king, one summer morn, blew a blast on his bugle horn, sending his signal through the land of Drontheim, and to the husting held at mere gathered the farmers far and near, with their war weapons ready to confront him. Ploughing under the morning star, old Iron Beard in Iriar heard the summons chuckling with a low laugh. He wiped the sweat drops from his brow, unharnessed his horses from the plough, and, clattering, came on horseback to King Olaf. He was the churliest of the churls, little he cared for king or earls. 
Bitter as home-brewed ale were his foaming passions. Hodden grey was the garb he wore, and by the hammer of Thor he swore. He hated the narrow town and all its fashions. But he loved the freedom of his farm, his ale at night by the fireside warm, Gudrun his daughter with her flaxen tresses. He loved his horses and his herds, the smell of the earth and the song of birds, his well-filled barns, his brook with its water-cresses. Huge and cumbersome was his frame, his beard, from which he took his name, frosty and fierce, like that of Hymer the giant. So at the husting he appeared, the farmer of Iria, Ironbeard, on horseback with an attitude defiant, and to King Olaf he cried aloud out of the middle of the crowd that tossed about him like a stormy ocean, such sacrifices shalt thou bring to Odin and to Thor, O king, as other kings have done in their devotion. King Olaf answered, I command this land to be a Christian land. Here is my bishop, who the folk baptizes. But if you ask me to restore your sacrifices, stained with gore, then will I offer human sacrifices. Not slaves and peasants shall they be, but men of note and high degree, such men as Orm of Lyra and Car of Greiting. Then to their temple strode he in, and loud behind him heard the din of his men-at-arms and the peasants, fiercely fighting. There in the temple, carved in wood, the image of great Odin stood, and other gods, with Thor supreme among them. King Olaf smote them with the blade of his huge war-axe, gold inlaid, and downward shattered to the pavement flung them at the same moment rose without from the contending crowd a shout a mingled sound of triumph and of wailing and there upon the trampled plain the farmer ironbeard lay slain midway between the assailed and the assailing king olaf from the doorway spoke choose ye between two things my folk to be baptized or given up to slaughter and seeing their leader stark and dead, the people with a murmur said, O king, baptize us with thy holy water. So all the Drontheim land became a Christian land in name and fame, in the old gods no more believing and trusting. And as a blood atonement, soon King Olaf wed the fair Gudrun, and thus in peace ended the Drontheim husting. Part Eight, Gudrun, on King Olaf's bridal night shines the moon with tender light, and across the chamber streams its tide of dreams. At the fatal midnight hour, when all evil things have power, in the glimmer of the moon stands Gudrun, close against her heaving breast. Something in her hand is pressed, like an icicle. Its sheen is cold and keen. On the cairn are fixed her eyes where her murdered father lies, and a voice remote and drear she seems to hear. What a bridal night is this! Cold will be the dagger's kiss, laden with the chill of death is its breath. Like the drifting snow, she sweeps to the couch where Olaf sleeps. Suddenly he wakes and stirs, his eyes meet hers. What is that? King Olaf said, gleams so bright above thy head. Wherefore standest thou so white in pale moonlight? Tis the bodkin that I wear when at night I bind my hair. It woke me falling on the floor. Tis nothing more. Forests have ears, and fields have eyes. Often treachery lurking lies underneath the fairest hair. Gudrun, beware. Ere the earliest peep of morn blew King Olaf's bugle-horn, and forever sundered ride bridegroom and bride. Part Nine, Thangbrand the Priest Short of stature, large of limb, burly face and russet beard, all the women stared at him when in Iceland he appeared. Look, they said with nodding head, there goes Thangbrand, Olaf's priest. All the prayers he knew by rote, he could preach like chrysostome, from the fathers he could quote. 
he had even been at rome a learned clerk a man of mark was this thangbrand olaf's priest he was quarrelsome and loud and impatient of control boisterous in the market crowd boisterous at the wassail bowl everywhere would drink and swear swaggering thangbrand olaf's priest in his house this malcontent could the king no longer bear so to iceland he was sent to convert the heathen there and away one summer day sailed this thangbrand olaf's priest there in iceland o'er their books poured the people day and night but he did not like their looks nor the songs they used to write all this rhyme is waste of time grumbled thangbrand olaf's priest to the alehouse where he sat came the scalds and saga men is it to be wondered at that they quarrelled now and then when o'er his beer began to leer drunken thangbrand olaf's priest all the folk in altafjord boasted of their island grand saying in a single word iceland is the finest land that the sun doth shine upon loud laughed thangbrand olaf's priest and he answered what's the use of this bragging up and down when three women and one goose make a market in your town every scald satire scrawled on poor thangbrand olaf's priest something worse they did than that and what vexed him most of all was a figure in shovel hat drawn in charcoal on the wall with words that go sprawling below this is thangbrand olaf's priest hardly knowing what he did then he smote them might and main thorvald vile and vetalid lay there in the alehouse slain to-day we are gold to-morrow mould muttered thangbrand olaf's priest much in fear of axe and rope back to norway sailed he then o king olaf little hope is there of these iceland men meekly said with bending head pious thangbrand olaf's priest section ten roud the strong all the old gods are dead all the wild warlocks fled but the white christ lives and reigns and throughout my wild domains his gospel shall be spread on the evangelists thus swore king olaf but still in dreams of the night beheld he the crimson light and heard the voice that defied him who was crucified and challenged him to the fight to sigurd the bishop king olaf confessed it and sigurd the bishop said the old gods are not dead for the great thor still reigns and among the jarls and thanes the old witchcraft still is spread thus to king olaf said sigurd the bishop far north in the sultan fjord by rapine fire and sword lives the viking roud the strong all the godo isles belong to him and his heathen horde thus went on speaking sigurd the bishop a warlock a wizard is he and lord of the wind and the sea and whichever way he sails he has ever favouring gales by his craft in sorcery here the sign of the cross made devoutly king olaf with rites that we both abhor he worships odin and thor so it cannot yet be said that all the old gods are dead and the warlocks are no more flushing with anger said sigurd the bishop then king olaf cried aloud i will talk with this mighty roud and along the sultan fjord preach the gospel with my sword or be brought back in my shroud so northward from drontheim sailed king olaf part eleven bishop sigurd at sultan fjord loud the angry wind was wailing as king olaf's ships came sailing northward out of drontheim haven to the mouth of sultan fjord though the flying sea spray drenches fore and aft the rowers benches not a single heart is craven of the champions there on board all without the fjord was quiet but within it storm and riot such as on his viking cruises roud the strong was wont to ride 
and the sea through all its tideways swept the reeling vessels sideways as the leaves are swept through sluices when the floodgates open wide tis the warlock tis the demon roud cried sigurd to the seamen but the lord is not affrighted by the witchcraft of his foes to the ship's bow he ascended by his choristers attended round him were the tapers lighted and the sacred incense rose on the bow stood bishop sigurd in his robes as one transfigured and the crucifix he planted high amid the rain and mist then with holy water sprinkled all the ship the mass bells tinkled loud the monks around him chanted loud he read the evangelist as into the fjord they darted on each side the water parted down a path like silver molten steadily rode king olaf's ships steadily burned all night the tapers and the white christ through the vapours gleamed across the fjord of sultan as through john's apocalypse till at last they reached raud's dwelling on the little isle of gelling not a guard was at the doorway not a glimmer of light was seen but at anchor carved and gilded lay the dragon-ship he builded twas the grandest ship in norway with its crest and scales of green up the stairway softly creeping to the loft where raud was sleeping with their fists they burst asunder bolt and bar that held the door drunken with sleep and ale they found him dragged him from his bed and bound him while he stared with stupid wonder at the look and garb they wore then king olaf said o oh, sea king little time have we for speaking choose between the good and evil be baptized or thou shalt die but in scorn the heathen scoffer answered i disdain thine offer neither fear i god nor devil thee and thy gospel i defy then between his jaws distended when his frantic struggles ended through king olaf's horn an adder touched by fire they forced to glide sharp his tooth was as an arrow as he gnawed through bone and marrow but without a groan or shudder roud the strong blaspheming died then baptized they all that region swarthy lap and fair norwegian far as swims the salmon leaping up the streams of sultan fjord in their temples thor and odin lay in dust and ashes trodden as king olaf onward sweeping preached the gospel with his sword then he took the carved and gilded dragon-ship that raud had builded and the tiller single-handed grasping steered into the main southward sailed the sea-gulls o'er him southward sailed the ship that bore him till at drontheim haven landed olaf and his crew again part twelve king olaf's christmas at drontheim olaf the king heard the bells of yuletide ring as he sat in his banquet hall drinking the nut-brown ale with his bearded berserks hale and tall three days his yuletide feasts he held with bishops and priests and his horn filled up to the brim but the ale was never too strong nor the saga man's tale too long for him o'er his drinking horn the sign he made of the cross divine as he drank and muttered his prayers but the berserks evermore made the sign of the hammer of thor over theirs the gleams of the firelight dance upon helmet and hauberk and lance and laugh in the eyes of the king and he cries to halfred the scald grey-bearded wrinkled and bald sing sing me a song divine with a sword in every line and this shall be thy reward and he loosened the belt at his waist, and in front of the singer placed his sword. Quernbiter of Hakon the Good, wherewith at a stroke he hewed the millstone through and through, and foot-breadth of Thoralf the Strong were neither so broad nor so long nor so true. Then the scald took his harp and sang, and loud through the music rang the sound of that shining word and the harp-strings a clangour made as if they were struck with the blade of a sword 
and the berserks round about broke forth into a shout that made the rafters ring. They smote with their fists on the board, and shouted, Long live the sword and the king! But the king said, O oh, my son, I miss the bright word in one of thy measures and thy rhymes. And Holfred the Skald replied, In another twas multiplied three times. Then King Olaf raised the hilt of iron, cross-shaped and gilt, and said, Do not refuse, count well the gain and the loss, Thor's hammer or Christ's cross, choose. And Halfred the Skald said, This in the name of the Lord I kiss, who on it was crucified. And a shout went round the board in the name of Christ the Lord, who died. Then over the waste of snows, the noonday sun uprose through the driving mists revealed like the lifting of the host by incense clouds almost concealed on the shining wall a vast and shadowy cross was cast from the hilt of the lifted sword and in foaming cups of ale the berserks cried was hail to the lord end of section five Section six of Tales of a Wayside Inn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Yearsley. Tales of a Wayside Inn by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Section thirteen. The Building of the Long Serpent. Thorberg Skafting, master builder, in his shipyard by the sea, whistled, saying, "'Twould bewilder any man but Thorberg Skafting, any man but me. Near him lay the dragon stranded, built of old by Raud the Strong, and King Olaf had commanded he should build another dragon, twice as large and long. Therefore whistled Thorberg Skafting, as he sat with half-closed eyes, and his head turned sideways, drafting that new vessel for King Olaf, twice the dragon's size. Round him, busily hewed and hammered, mallet huge and heavy axe, workmen laughed and sang and clamoured, whirred the wheels, that into rigging spun the shining flax. All this tumult heard the master, it was music to his ear, fancy whispered all the faster, men shall hear of Thorberg's gafting for a hundred year. Workmen sweating at the forges fashioned iron bolt and bar. Like a warlock's midnight orgies smoked and bubbled the black cauldron with the boiling tar. Did the warlocks mingle in it, Thorberg's gafting? Any curse? Could you not be gone a minute, but some mischief must be doing, turning bad to worse? T'was an ill wind that came wafting from his homestead words of woe. To his farm went Thorberg Skafting, oft repeating to his workmen, Build ye thus and so. After long delays, returning came the master back by night. To his shipyard longing, yearning, hurried he, and did not leave it till the morning's light. Come and see my ship, my darling, on the morrow, said the king, finished now from keel to carling. Never yet was seen in Norway such a wondrous thing. In the shipyard, idly talking, at the ship the workmen stared. Someone, all their labour balking, down her sides had cut deep gashes, not a plank was spared. Death be to the evil doer, with an oath King Olaf spoke, but rewards to his pursuer, and with wrath his face grew redder than his scarlet cloak. Straight the master-builder, smiling, answered thus the angry king, Cease blaspheming and reviling, Olaf, it was Thorberg Skafting who has done this thing. Then he chipped and smoothed the planking, till the king, delighted, swore, with much lauding and much thanking, Handsomer is now my dragon than she was before. Seventy ells and four extended on the grass the vessel's keel, High above it, gilt and splendid, rose the figurehead ferocious with its crest of steel. Then they launched her from the trestles in the shipyard by the sea. She was the grandest of all vessels, 
Never ship was built in Norway, half so fine as she. The long serpent was she christened, mid the roar of cheer on cheer. They who to the saga listened, heard the name of Thorberg Skafting for a hundred year. Section 14. The Crew of the Long Serpent Safe at anchor in Drontheim Bay, King Olaf's fleet assembled lay and striped with white and blue downward fluttered sail and banner as alights the screaming lanner lustily cheered in their wild manner the long serpent's crew her forecastle man was ulf the red like a wolf's was his shaggy head his teeth as large and white his beard of grey and russet blended round as a swallow's nest descended as standard-bearer he defended Olaf's flag in the fight. Near him Kolbjorn had his place, like the king in garb and face, so gallant and so hale. Every cabin-boy and varlet wondered at his cloak of scarlet. Like a river, frozen and starlit, gleamed his coat of mail. By the bulkhead, tall and dark, stood Thrand Rame of Thelemark, a figure gaunt and grand, on his hairy arm imprinted was an anchor, azure-tinted. Like Thor's hammer, huge and dinted, was his brawny hand. Einar Tamberskelva, bare to the winds his golden hair, by the mainmast stood. Graceful was his form and slender, and his eyes were deep and tender as a woman's, in the splendour of her maidenhood. In the forehold, Bjorn and Bork, watched the sailors at their work. Heavens, how they swore! Thirty men they each commanded, iron-sinewed, horny-handed, shoulders broad and chests expanded, tugging at the oar. These, and many more like these, with King Olaf sailed the seas, till the waters vast filled them with a vague devotion, with the freedom and the motion, with the royal and roar of ocean, and the sounding blast. When they landed from the fleet, how they roared through Drontheim's street, boisterous as the gale! How they laughed and stamped and pounded, till the tavern roof resounded, and the host looked on astounded, as they drank the ale. Never saw the wild North Sea such a gallant company sail its billows blue. Never, while they cruised and quarrelled, Old King Gorm, or Bluetooth Harold, owned a ship so well apparelled, boasted such a crew. Section 15. A Little Bird in the Air A little bird in the air is singing of Thyri the fair, the sister of Svend the Dane, and the song of the garrulous bird in the streets of the town is heard, and repeated again and again. Hoist up your sails of silk, and flee away from each other. To King Burislav, it is said, was the beautiful Thyri wed, and a sorrowful bride went she. And after a week and a day, she has fled away and away from his town by the stormy sea. Hoist up your sails of silk, and flee away from each other. They say that through heat and through cold, through wheels, they say, and through wold, by day and by night, they say, she has fled, and the gossips report she has come to King Olaf's court, and the town is all in dismay. Hoist up your sails of silk, and flee away from each other. It is whispered King Olaf has seen, has talked with the beautiful queen, and they wonder how it will end. For surely, if here she remain, it is war with King Svend the Dane, and King Burislav the Vend. Hoist up your sails of silk, and flee away from each other. O oh, greatest wonder of all! It is published in Hamlet and Hall. It roars like a flame that is fanned. The king, yes, Olaf the king, has wedded her with his ring, and Thyri is queen in the land. Hoist up your sails of silk, and flee away from each other. Section 16 Queen Thyri and the Angelica Stalks Northward over Drontheim, 
flew the clamorous seagulls, sang the lark and linnet from the meadows green. Weeping in her chamber, lonely and unhappy, sat the drotning Thyri, sat King Olaf's queen. In at all the windows streamed the pleasant sunshine, on the roof above her softly cooed the dove. But the sound she heard not, nor the sunshine heeded, for the thoughts of Thyri were not thoughts of love. Then King Olaf entered, beautiful as morning, like the sun at Easter, shone his happy face. In his hand he carried Angelica's uprooted, with delicious fragrance filling all the place. Like a rainy midnight sat the drotning Thyri, even the smile of Olaf could not cheer her gloom, nor the stalks he gave her with a gracious gesture, and with words as pleasant as their own perfume. In her hands he placed them, and her jewelled fingers through the green leaves glistened like the dews of morn. But she cast them from her, haughty and indignant. On the floor she threw them with a look of scorn. Richer presents, said she, gave King Harold Gormson to the Queen, my mother, than such worthless weeds, when he ravaged Norway, laying waste the kingdom, seizing scat and treasure for her royal needs. But thou darest not venture through the sound to Vendland, my domains to rescue from King Burislav, lest King Svend of Denmark, forked beard, my brother, scatter all thy vessels as the wind the chaff. Then up sprang King Olaf like a reindeer bounding. With an oath he answered thus, the luckless queen, Never did Olaf fear King Svend of Denmark. This right hand shall hail him by his forked chin. Then he left the chamber, thundering through the doorway. Loud his steps resounded down the outer stair. Smarting with the insult, through the streets of Drontheim strode he red and wrathful with his stately air. All his ships he gathered, summoned all his forces, making his war levy in the region round. Down the coast of Norway, like a flock of seagulls, sailed the fleet of Olaf through the Danish sound. With his own hand fearless steered he the long serpent, strained the creaking cordage, bent each boom and gaff, till in Vendland landing the domains of Thyri he redeemed and rescued from King Burislav. Then said Olaf, laughing, Not ten yoke of oxen have the power to draw us like a woman's hair. Now will I confess it, better things are jewels than Angelica stalks are for a queen to wear. Section 17 King Svend of the Forked Beard Loudly the sailors cheered Svend of the Forked Beard, as with his fleet he steered southward to Vendland where with their courses hauled all were together called under the Isle of Svold, near to the mainland. After Queen Gunhild's death, so the old saga saith, plighted King Svend his faith to Sigrid the haughty, and to avenge his bride, soothing her wounded pride, over the waters wide King Olaf sought he. Still on her scornful face, blushing with deep disgrace, bore she the crimson trace of Olaf's gauntlet. Like a malignant star blazing in heaven afar, red shone the angry scar under her frontlet. Oft to King Svend she spake, For thine own honour's sake shalt thou swift vengeance take on the vile coward, until the king at last, gusty and overcast, like a tempestuous blast, threatened and lowered. Soon as the spring appeared, Svend of the forked beard, High his red standard reared, eager for battle, While every warlike Dane, seizing his arms again, Left all unsown the grain, unhoused the cattle. Likewise the Swedish king summoned in haste the ting, Weapons and men to bring in aid of Denmark, Eric the Norseman, too, as the war tidings flew, sailed with a chosen crew from Lapland and Finnmark. So upon Easter day sailed the three kings away out of the sheltered bay in the bright season. With them Earl Sigvald came, eager for spoil and fame, 
pity that such a name stooped to such treason safe under svold at last now were their anchors cast safe from the sea and blast plotted the three kings while with a base intent southward earl sigvald went on a foul errand bent unto the sea kings thence to hold on his course unto king olaf's force lying within the horse mouths of stethaven him to ensnare and bring unto the danish king who his dead course would fling forth to the raven End of section 6section seven of tales of a wayside inn this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by peter yearsley tales of a wayside inn by henry wadsworth longfellow the musician's tale section thirteen king olaf and earl sigveld on the grey sea sands king olaf stands northward and seaward he points with his hands with eddy and whirl the sea-tides curl, Washing the sandals of Sigvald the earl. The mariners shout, the ships swing about, The yards are all hoisted, the sails flutter out, The war-horns are played, the anchors are weighed, Like moths in the distance, the sails flit and fade. The sea is like lead, the harbour lies dead, As a corse on the seashore whose spirit has fled. On that fatal day, the histories say, Seventy vessels sailed out of the bay, But soon scattered wide o'er the billows they ride, While Sigvald and Olaf sail side by side. Cried the earl, I your pilot will be, For I know all the channels where flows the deep sea. So into the strait where his foes lie in wait, Gallant King Olaf sails to his fate. Then the sea-fog Fails the ships and their sails. Queen Sigrid the haughty, thy vengeance prevails. Section 19. King Olaf's War Horns. Strike the sails, King Olaf said. Never shall men of mine take flight. Never away from battle I fled. Never away from my foes. Let gods dispose of my life in the fight. Sound the horns, said Olaf the king, and suddenly through the drifting broom the blare of the horns began to ring, like the terrible trumpet shock of Ragnarok on the day of doom. Louder and louder the war horns sang over the level floor of the flood. All the sails came down with a clang, and there in the mist overhead the sun hung red as a drop of blood. Drifting down on the Danish fleet, Three together the ships were lashed, so that neither should turn and retreat. In the midst, but in front of the rest, the burnished crest of the serpent flashed. King Olaf stood on the quarter-deck with bow of ash and arrows of oak. His gilded shield was without a fleck, his helmet inlaid with gold, and in many a fold hung his crimson cloak. On the forecastle Ulf the Red watched the lashing of the ships. If the serpent lie so far ahead, we shall have hard work of it here, said he with a sneer on his bearded lips. King Olaf laid an arrow on string. Have I a coward on board? said he. Shoot it another way, O king, sullenly answered Ulf, the old sea-wolf. You have need of me. In front came Svend, the king of the Danes, sweeping down with his fifty rowers. To the right the Swedish king with his thanes, and on board of the iron beard earl eric steered on the left with his oars these soft danes and swedes said the king at home with their wives had better stay than come within reach of my serpent's sting but where eric the norseman leads heroic deeds will be done to-day then as together the vessels crashed eric severed the cables of hide with which king olaf's ships were lashed and left them to drive and drift with the currents swift of the outward tide. Louder the war-horns growl and snarl, sharper the dragons bite and sting. Eric the son of Hakon Jarl, a death drink, salt as the sea pledges to thee, Olaf the king. Section 20. 
Einar Tambuskelva. It was Einar Tambuskelva stood beside the mast. From his yew bow, tipped with silver, flew the arrows fast, aimed at Eric unavailing as he sat concealed, half behind the quarter railing, half behind his shield. First an arrow struck the tiller, just above his head. Sing, O Avin Skalda Spiller, then Earl Eric said. Sing the song of Hakon dying, sing his funeral wail, and another arrow flying grazed his coat of mail. Turning to a Lapland yeoman, as the arrow passed, said Earl Eric, shoot that bowman standing by the mast. Sooner than the word was spoken flew the yeoman's shaft, Einar's bow in twain was broken, Einar only laughed. What was that? said Olaf, standing on the quarter-deck. Something heard I, like the stranding of a shattered wreck. Einar then, the arrow taking from the loosened string, answered, That was Norway breaking from thy hand, O king. Thou art but a poor diviner, straightway Olaf said. Take my bow, and swifter, Einar, let thy shafts be sped. Of his bows the fairest choosing, reached he from above. Einar saw the blood drops oozing through his iron glove. But the bow was thin and narrow. At the first assay, o'er its head he drew the arrow, flung the bow away. Said with hot and angry temper, flushing in his cheek, Olaf, for so great a kymper are thy bows too weak. Then with smile of joy defiant on his beardless lip, scaled he, light and self-reliant, Eric's dragon-ship. Loose his golden locks were flowing, bright his armour gleamed like St. Michael overthrowing Lucifer, he seemed. Section 21. King Olaf's Death Drink. All day has the battle raged, all day have the ships engaged, but not yet is assuaged the vengeance of Eric the Earl. The decks with blood are red, the arrows of death are sped, the ships are filled with the dead, and the spears the champions hurl. They drift as wrecks on the tide, the grappling irons are plied, the boarders climb up the side, the shouts are feeble and few. Ah, never shall Norway again see her sailors come back o'er the main. They all lie wounded or slain, or asleep in the billows blue. On the deck stands Olaf the king, around him whistle and sing the spears that the foemen fling and the stones they hurl with their hands. In the midst of the stones and the spears, Colbjorn the marshal appears, his shield in the air he uprears, by the side of King Olaf he stands. O'er the slippery wreck of the long serpent's deck, sweeps Eric with hardly a check, his lips with anger are pale. He hews with his axe at the mast, till it falls with the sails overcast like a snow-covered pine in the vast dim forests of orkadale seeking king olaf then he rushes aft with his men as a hunter into the den of the bear when he stands at bay remember karl hakon he cries when lo on his wondering eyes two kingly figures arise two olafs in warlike array then kolbjorn speaks in the ear of king olaf a word of cheer in a whisper that none may hear, with a smile on his tremulous lips. Two shields raised high in the air, two flashes of golden hair, two scarlet meteors glare, and both have leapt from the ship. Earl Eric's men in the boats seize Colbion's shield as it floats, and cry from their hairy throats, See, it is Olaf the king! While far on the opposite side floats another shield on the tide, like a jewel set in the wide sea current's eddying ring there is told a wonderful tale how the king stripped off his mail like leaves of the brown sea kale as he swam beneath the main but the young grew old and grey and never by night or by day in his kingdom of norway was king olaf seen again section twenty two the nun of nidaros in the convent of Drontheim, alone in her chamber, knelt Astrid the abbess at midnight, 
adoring, beseeching, entreating the Virgin and Mother. She heard in the silence the voice of one speaking, without, in the darkness, in gusts of the night wind, now louder, now nearer, now lost in the distance. The voice of a stranger, it seemed, as she listened, of someone who answered, beseeching, imploring, a cry from afar off she could not distinguish. The voice of St. John, the beloved disciple, who wandered and waited the Master's appearance, alone in the darkness, unsheltered and friendless. It is accepted, the angry defiance, the challenge of battle. It is accepted, but not with the weapons of war that thou wieldest. Cross against corslet, love against hatred, peace cry for war cry. Patience is powerful. He that o'ercometh hath power o'er the nations. As torrents in summer, half dried in their channels, suddenly rise, though the sky is still cloudless, for rain has been falling far off at their fountains, so hearts that are fainting grow full to o'erflowing, and they that behold it marvel and know not that God at their fountains far off has been raining. Stronger than steel is the sword of the spirit, swifter than arrows the light of the truth is, greater than anger is love, and subdueth. Thou art a phantom, a shape of the sea mist, a shape of the brumal rain and the darkness, fearful and formless. Day dawns, and thou art not. The dawn is not distant, nor is the night starless. Love is eternal. God is still God, and his faith shall not fail us. Christ is eternal. Interlude A strain of music closed the tale, A low, monotonous funeral wail, That with its cadence wild and sweet Made the long saga more complete. Thank God, the theologian said, The reign of violence is dead, Or dying, surely, from the world while love triumphant reigns instead, and in a brighter sky o'erhead his blessed banners are unfurled. And most of all, thank God for this, the war and waste of clashing creeds now end in words, and not in deeds, and no one suffers loss or bleeds for thoughts that men call heresies. I stand without here in the porch, I hear the bell's melodious din, I hear the organ peal within, I hear the prayer with words that scorch like sparks from an inverted torch, I hear the sermon upon sin with threatenings of the last account, and all, translated in the air, reach me but as our dear Lord's prayer, and as the sermon on the mount. Must it be Calvin and not Christ? Must it be Athanasian creeds, or holy water, books, and beads? Must struggling souls remain content with counsels and decrees of Trent? And can it be enough for these the Christian church, the year in balms with evergreens and boughs of palms, and fills the air with litanies? I know that yonder Pharisee thanks God that he is not like me, in my humiliation dressed I only stand and beat my breast and pray for human charity. Not to one church alone, but seven, the voice prophetic spake from heaven, and unto each the promise came, diversified, but still the same, for him that overcometh are the new name written on the stone, the raiment white, the crown, the throne, and I will give him the morning star. Ah, to how many! Faith has been no evidence of things unseen, but a dim shadow that recasts the creed of the phantasiasts, for whom no man of sorrows died, for whom the tragedy divine was but a symbol and a sign, and Christ a phantom crucified. For others a diviner creed is living in the life they lead. The passing of their beautiful feet blesses the pavement of the street, and all their looks and words repeat old Fuller's saying, wise and sweet, not as a vulture, but a dove, the Holy Ghost came from above. And this brings back to me a tale, so sad the hearer well may quail, and question if such things can be. 
Yet in the chronicles of Spain, down the dark pages, runs this stain, and naught can wash them white again. So fearful is the tragedy. End of section 7section 8 of tales of a wayside inn this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by peter yearsley tales of a wayside inn by henry wadsworth longfellow the theologian's tale torquemada in the heroic days when ferdinand and isabella ruled the spanish land and torquemada with his subtle brain ruled them as grand inquisitor of spain in a great castle near valladolid moated and high and by fair woodlands hid there dwelt as from the chronicles we learn an old hidalgo proud and taciturn whose name has perished with his towers of stone and all his actions save this one alone this one so terrible perhaps T'were best if it too were forgotten with the rest, Unless perchance our eyes can see therein The martyrdom triumphant o'er the sin, A double picture with its gloom and glow, The splendour overhead, the death below. This sombre man counted each day as lost On which his feet no sacred threshold crossed, and when he chanced the passing host to meet, He knelt and prayed devoutly in the street. Oft he confessed, and with each mutinous thought, As with wild beasts at Ephesus, he fought. In deep contrition scourged himself in Lent, Walked in processions with his head down bent. At plays of Corpus Christi oft was seen, And on Palm Sunday bore his bow of green. His only pastime was to hunt the boar Through tangled thickets of the forest hoar, Or with his jingling mules to hurry down To some grand bullfight in the neighbouring town, Or in the crowd with lighted taper stand, When Jews were burned or banished from the land. Then stirred within him a tumultuous joy, The demon whose delight it is to destroy, Shook him, and shouted with a trumpet tone, Kill! Kill! and let the Lord find out his own. And now, in that old castle in the wood, his daughters, in the dawn of womanhood, returning from their convent school, had made resplendent with their bloom the forest shade, reminding him of their dead mother's face, when first she came into that gloomy place, a memory in his heart as dim and sweet as moonlight in a solitary street, where the same rays that lift the sea are thrown lovely but powerless upon walls of stone. These two fair daughters of a mother dead were all the dream had left him as it fled, a joy at first, and then a growing care, as if a voice within him cried, Beware! A vague presentiment of impending doom, like ghostly footsteps in a vacant room, haunted him, day and night, a formless fear that death to some one of his house was near, with dark surmises of a hidden crime, made life itself a death before its time. Jealous, suspicious, with no sense of shame, a spy upon his daughters he became, with velvet slippers noiseless on the floors, he glided softly through half-open doors, now in the room and now upon the stair, he stood beside them ere they were aware. He listened in the passage when they talked. He watched them from the casement when they walked. He saw the gypsy haunt the river's side. He saw the monk among the cork-trees glide. And, tortured by the mystery and the doubt of some dark secret, past his finding out, baffled he paused. Then, reassured again, pursued the flying phantom of his brain. He watched them even when they knelt in church, and then, descending lower in his search, questioned the servants, and with eager eyes listened incredulous to their replies. The gypsy? None had seen her in the wood. The monk? A mendicant, in search of food. 
at length the awful revelation came crushing at once his pride of birth and name the hopes his yearning bosom forward cast and the ancestral glories of the past all fell together crumbling in disgrace a turret rent from battlement to base his daughters talking in the dead of night in their own chamber and without a light listening as he was wont he overheard and learned the dreadful secret word by word and hurrying from his castle with a cry he raised his hands to the unpitying sky repeating one dread word till bush and tree caught it and shuddering answered heresy wrapped in his cloak his hat drawn o'er his face now hurrying forward now with lingering pace he walked all night the alleys of his park with one unseen companion in the dark the demon who within him lay in wait and by his presence turned his love to hate forever muttering in an undertone kill kill and let the lord find out his own upon the morrow after early mass while yet the dew was glistening on the grass and all the woods were musical with birds the old hidalgo uttering fearful words walked homeward with the priest and in his room summoned his trembling daughters to their doom when questioned with brief answers they replied nor when accused evaded or denied expostulations passionate appeals all that the human heart most fears or feels in vain the priest with earnest voice essayed in vain the father threatened wept and prayed until at last he said with haughty mien the holy offices then must intervene and now the grand inquisitor of spain with all the fifty horsemen of his train his awful name resounding like the blast of funeral trumpets as he onward passed came to valladolid and there began to harry the rich jews with fire and ban to him the hidalgo went and at the gate demanded audience on affairs of state and in a secret chamber stood before a venerable grey-beard of fourscore dressed in the hood and habit of a friar out of his eyes flashed a consuming fire and in his hand the mystic horn he held which poison and all noxious charms dispelled he heard in silence the hidalgo's tale then answered in a voice that made him quail son of the church when abraham of old to sacrifice his only son was told he did not pause to parley nor protest but hastened to obey the lord's behest in him it was accounted righteousness the holy church expects of thee no less a sacred frenzy seized the father's brain and mercy from that hour implored in vain ah who will e'er believe the words i say his daughters he accused and the same day they both were cast into the dungeon's gloom that dismal antechamber of the tomb arraigned condemned and sentenced to the flame the secret torture and the public shame then to the grand inquisitor once more the hidalgo went more eager than before and said when abraham offered up his son he clave the wood wherewith it might be done by his example taught let me too bring wood from the forest for my offering and the deep voice without a pause replied son of the church by faith now justified complete thy sacrifice even as thou wilt the church absolves thy conscience from all guilt then this most wretched father went his way into the woods that round his castle lay where once his daughters in their childhood played with their young mother in the sun and shade now all the leaves had fallen the branches bare made a perpetual moaning in the air and screaming from their eyries overhead the ravens sailed athwart the sky of lead with his own hands he lopped the boughs and bound faggots that crackled with foreboding sound and on his mules caparisoned and gay with bells and tassels sent them on their way then with his mind on one dark purpose bent again to the inquisitor he went and said 
behold the faggots i have brought and now lest my atonement be as naught grant me one more request one last desire with my own hands to light the funeral fire and torquemada answered from his seat son of the church thine offering is complete her servants through all ages shall not cease to magnify thy deed depart in peace upon the market-place builded of stone the scaffold rose whereon death claimed his own at the four corners in stern attitude four statues of the hebrew prophets stood gazing with calm indifference in their eyes upon this place of human sacrifice round which was gathered fast the eager crowd with clamour of voices dissonant and loud and every roof and window was alive with restless gazers swarming like a hive the church bells tolled the chant of monks drew near loud trumpets stammered forth their notes of fear a line of torches smoked along the street there was a stir a rush a tramp of feet and with its banners floating in the air slowly the long procession crossed the square and to the statues of the prophet bound the victims stood with faggots piled around then all the air a blast of trumpets shook and louder sang the monks with bell and book and the hidalgo lofty stern and proud lifted his torch and bursting through the crowd lighted in haste the faggots and then fled lest those imploring eyes should strike him dead o oh, pitiless skies why did your clouds retain for peasants fields their floods of hoarded rain o oh, pitiless earth why opened no abyss to bury in its chasm a crime like this that night a mingled column of fire and smoke from the dark thickets of the forest broke and glaring o'er the landscape leagues away made all the fields and hamlets bright as day wrapped in a sheet of flame the castle blazed and as the villagers in terror gazed they saw the figure of that cruel knight lean from a window in the turret's height his ghastly face illumined with the glare his hands upraised above his head in prayer till the floor sank beneath him and he fell down the black hollow of that burning well three centuries and more above his bones have piled the oblivious years like funeral stones his name has perished with him and no trace remains on earth of his afflicted race but torquemada's name with clouds o'ercast looms in the distant landscape of the past like a burnt tower upon a blackened heath lit by the fires of burning woods beneath interlude thus closed the tale of guilt and gloom that cast upon each listener's face its shadow and for some brief space unbroken silence filled the room the jew was thoughtful and distressed upon his memory thronged and pressed the persecution of his race their wrongs and sufferings and disgrace his head was sunk upon his breast and from his eyes alternate came flashes of wrath and tears of shame the student first the silence broke as one who long has lain in wait with purpose to retaliate and thus he dealt the avenging stroke in such a company as this a tale so tragic seems amiss that by its terrible control o'er masters and drags down the soul into a fathomless abyss the italian tales that you disdain some merry knight of straparole or machiavelli's belfagor would cheer us and delight us more give greater pleasure and less pain than your grim tragedies of spain and here the poet raised his hand with such entreaty and command it stopped discussion at its birth and said the story i shall tell has meaning in it if not mirth listen and hear what once befell the merry birds of killingworth End of section 8
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Yearsley. Tales of a Wayside Inn by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. The Poet's Tale. The Birds of Killingworth. It was the season when through all the land the Merle and Mavis build, and building, sing those lovely lyrics written by his hand, whom Saxon Kaidmon calls the blithe heart king. When on the boughs the purple buds expand, the banners of the vanguard of the spring, and rivulets rejoicing rush and leap, and wave their fluttering signals from the steep. The robin and the bluebird piping loud filled all the blossoming orchards with their glee, the sparrows chirped, as if they still were proud their race in holy writ should mentioned be, and hungry crows assembled in a crowd clamoured their piteous prayer incessantly, knowing who hears the raven's cry, and said, Give us, O Lord, this day our daily bread. Across the sound the birds of passage sailed, speaking some unknown language, strange and sweet, of tropic isle remote and passing hailed the village with the cheers of all their fleet, or quarrelling together laughed and railed like foreign sailors landed in the street of seaport town, and without landish noise of oaths and gibberish, frightening girls and boys. Thus came the jocund spring in Killingworth, in fabulous days some hundred years ago, and thrifty farmers, as they tilled the earth, heard with alarm the cawing of the crow, that mingled with the universal mirth, Cassandra-like, prognosticating woe. They shook their heads, and doomed with dreadful words to swift destruction the whole race of birds. And a town meeting was convened straightway to set a price upon the guilty heads of these marauders, who, in lieu of pay, levied blackmail upon the garden beds and cornfields, and beheld without dismay the awful scarecrow with his fluttering shreds, the skeleton that waited at their feast, whereby their sinful pleasure was increased. Then from his house, a temple painted white, with fluted columns and a roof of red, the squire came forth, august and splendid sight, slowly descending with majestic tread three flights of steps nor looking left nor right down the long street he walked as one who said a town that boasts inhabitants like me can have no lack of good society the parson too appeared a man austere the instinct of whose nature was to kill the wrath of god he preached from year to year and read with fervour Edwards on the will. His favourite pastime was to slay the deer in summer on some Adirondack hill. E'en now, while walking down the rural lane, he lopped the wayside lilies with his cane. From the academy, whose belfry crowned the hill of science with its vein of brass, came the preceptor, gazing idly round, now at the clouds and now at the green grass and all absorbed in reveries profound of fair Almira in the upper class, who was, as in a sonnet he had said, as pure as water and as good as bread. And next the deacon issued from his door, in his voluminous neckcloth, white as snow, a suit of sable bombazine he wore. His form was ponderous, and his step was slow. There never was so wise a man before. He seemed the incarnate, Well, I told you so. And to perpetuate his great renown, There was a street named after him in town. These came together in the new town hall, With sundry farmers from the region round. The squire presided, dignified and tall, His air impressive and his reasoning sound. Ill fared it with the birds, both great and small, Hardly a friend in all that crowd they found, but enemies enough, who every one charged them with all the crimes beneath the sun. When they had ended, from his place apart rose the preceptor, to redress the wrong, and, trembling like a steed before the start, looked round bewildered on the expectant throng. 
then thought of fair Almira, and took heart to speak out what was in him, clear and strong, alike regardless of their smile or frown, and quite determined not to be laughed down. Plato, anticipating the reviewers, from his republic banished without pity the poets, in this little town of yours you put to death by means of a committee the ballad-singers and the troubadours, the street musicians of the heavenly city, the birds who make sweet music for us all in our dark hours, as David did for Saul, the thrush that carols at the dawn of day from the green steeples of the piney wood, the oriole in the elm, the noisy jay jargoning like a foreigner at his food, the bluebird balanced on some topmost spray, flooding with melody the neighbourhood, linnet and meadow-lark, and all the throng that dwell in nests, and have the gift of song. You slay them all, and wherefore? For the gain of a scant handful more or less of wheat, or rye, or barley, or some other grain, scratched up at random by industrious feet, searching for worm or weevil after rain, or a few cherries, that are not so sweet as are the songs these uninvited guests sing at their feast with comfortable breasts. Do you ne'er think what wondrous beings these? Do you ne'er think who made them, and who taught the dialect they speak, where melodies alone are the interpreters of thought, whose household words are songs in many keys, sweeter than instrument of man e'er caught? whose habitations in the tree-tops, even, are half-way houses on the road to heaven. Think every morning when the sun peeps through the dim leaf-latticed windows of the grove, how jubilant the happy birds renew their old melodious madrigals of love. And when you think of this, remember, too, tis always morning somewhere, and above the awakening continents, from shore to shore, somewhere the birds are singing evermore. Think of your woods and orchards without birds, of empty nests that cling to boughs and beams, as, in an idiot's brain, remembered words hang empty mid the cobwebs of his dreams. Will bleat of flocks or bellowing of herds make up for the lost music, when your teams drag home the stingy harvest, and no more the feathered gleamers follow to your door? What, would you rather see the incessant stir of insects in the windrows of the hay, and hear the locust and the grasshopper their melancholy hurdy-gurdies play? Is this more pleasant to you than the whir of meadow-lark and its sweet roundelay, or twitter of little field-fares, as you take your nooning in the shade of bush and brake? You call them thieves and pillagers, but know they are the winged wardens of your farms, who from the cornfields drive the insidious foe, and from your harvest keep a hundred harms. Even the blackest of them all, the crow, renders good service as your man-at-arms, crushing the beetle in his coat of mail, and crying havoc on the slug and snail. How can I teach your children gentleness, and mercy to the weak, and reverence for life, which in its weakness or excess is still a gleam of God's omnipotence, or death, which, seeming darkness, is no less the self-same light, although averted hence, when by your laws, your actions and your speech, you contradict the very things I teach. With this he closed, and through the audience went a murmur like the rustle of dead leaves, the farmers laughed and nodded, and some bent their yellow heads together like their sheaves. Men have no faith in fine-spun sentiment, who put their trust in bullocks and in beeves. The birds were doomed, and, as the record shows, a bounty offered for the heads of crows. There was another audience, out of reach, who had no voice nor vote in making laws but in the papers read his little speech, and crowned his modest temples with applause. They made him conscious, each one more than each. He still was victor, vanquished in their cause. Sweetest of all the applause he won from thee, O fair Almira, at the academy. And so 
the dreadful massacre began o'er fields and orchards and o'er woodland crests the ceaseless fusillade of terror ran dead fell the birds with blood-stains on their breasts or wounded crept away from sight of man while the young died of famine in their nests a slaughter to be told in groans not words the very st bartholomew of birds the summer came and all the birds were dead the days were like hot coals the very ground was burned to ashes in the orchards fed myriads of caterpillars and around the cultivated fields and garden beds hosts of devouring insects crawled and found no foe to check their march till they had made the land a desert without leaf or shade devoured by worms like herod was the town because like herod it had ruthlessly slaughtered the innocents from the trees spun down the canker worms upon the passers-by upon each woman's bonnet shawl and gown who shook them off with just a little cry they were the terror of each favourite walk the endless theme of all the village talk the farmers grew impatient but a few confessed their error and would not complain for after all the best thing one can do when it is raining is to let it rain then they repealed the law although they knew it would not call the dead to life again as schoolboys finding their mistake too late draw a wet sponge across the accusing slate that year in killingworth the autumn came without the light of his majestic look the wonder of the falling tongues of flame the illumined pages of his doomsday book a few lost leaves blushed crimson with their shame and drowned themselves despairing in the brook while the wild wind went moaning everywhere lamenting the dead children of the air but the next spring a stranger sight was seen a sight that never yet by bard was sung as great a wonder as it would have been if some dumb animal had found a tongue a wagon overarched with evergreen upon whose boughs were wicker cages hung all full of singing birds came down the street filling the air with music wild and sweet from all the country round these birds were brought by order of the town with anxious quest and loosened from their wicker prisons sought in woods and fields the places they loved best singing loud canticles which many thought were satires to the authorities addressed while others listening in green lanes averred such lovely music never had been heard but blither still and louder carolled they upon the morrow for they seemed to know it was the fair almira's wedding day and everywhere around above below when the preceptor bore his bride away their songs burst forth in joyous overflow and a new heaven bent over a new earth amid the sunny farms of killingworth finale the hour was late the fire burned low the landlord's eyes were closed in sleep and near the story's end a deep sonorous sound at times was heard as when the distant bagpipes blow at this all laughed the landlord stirred as one awaking from a swound and gazing anxiously around protested that he had not slept but only shut his eyes and kept his ears attentive to each word then all arose and said good night alone remained the drowsy squire to rake the embers of the fire and quench the waning parlour light while from the windows here and there the scattered lamps a moment gleamed and the illumined hostel seemed the constellation of the bear downward athwart the misty air sinking and setting toward the sun far off the village clock struck one end of section nine section ten of tales of a wayside inn this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by peter yearsley Tales of a Wayside Inn by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow Birds of Passage, Flight the Second 
THE CHILDREN'S HOUR Between the dark and the daylight, when the night is beginning to lower, comes a pause in the day's occupations that is known as the children's hour. I hear in the chamber above me the patter of little feet, the sound of a door that is opened, and voices, soft and sweet. From my study I see in the lamplight, descending the broad hall stair, grave Alice and laughing Allegra, and Edith with golden hair. A whisper, and then a silence. Yet I know by their merry eyes they are plotting and planning together to take me by surprise. A sudden rush from the stairway, a sudden raid from the hall. By three doors left unguarded they enter my castle wall. They climb up into my turret, o'er the arms and back of my chair. If I try to escape they surround me. They seem to be everywhere. They almost devour me with kisses. Their arms about me entwine. Till I think of the Bishop of Bingen in his mouse-tower on the Rhine. Do you think, O oh blue-eyed banditti, because you have scaled the wall, such an old moustache as I am is not a match for you all? I have you fast in my fortress, and will not let you depart, but put you down into the dungeon in the round tower of my heart. And there will I keep you for ever, yes, for ever and a day, till the walls shall crumble to ruin, and moulder in dust away. Enceladus Under Mount Etna he lies. It is slumber, it is not death, for he struggles at times to arise, and above him the lurid skies are hot with his fiery breath. The crags are piled on his breast, the earth is heaped on his head but the groans of his wild unrest, though smothered and half suppressed, are heard, and he is not dead. And the nations far away are watching with eager eyes. They talk together and say, Tomorrow, perhaps today, Enceladus will arise. And the old gods, the austere oppressors in their strength, stand aghast and white with fear at the ominous sounds they hear and tremble, and mutter, at length. Ah, me, for the land that is sown with the harvest of despair, where the burning cinders blown from the lips of the overthrown Enceladus fill the air, where ashes are heaped in drifts over vineyard and field and town, whenever he starts and lifts his head through the blackened rifts of the crags that keep him down. See, see, the red light shines! "'Tis the glare of his awful eyes, "'and the storm-wind shouts through the pines "'of Alps and of Apennines. "'Enceladus, arise!' "'The Cumberland. "'At anchor in Hampton Roads we lay, "'on board of the Cumberland, sloop of war, "'and at times, from the fortress across the bay, "'the alarum of drums swept past, "'or a bugle passed from the camp on the shore. Then far away to the south uprose a little feather of snow-white smoke, and we knew that the iron ship of our foes was steadily steering its course to try the force of our ribs of oak. Down upon us heavily runs, silent and sullen, the floating fort. Then comes a puff of smoke from her guns, and leaps the terrible death with fiery breath from each open port. We are not idle, but send her straight defiance, back in a full broadside, as hail rebounds from a roof of slate, rebounds our heavier hail from each iron scale of the monster's hide. Strike your flag, the rebel cries in his arrogant old plantation strain. Never, our gallant Morris replies, it is better to sink than to yield, and the whole air pealed with the cheers of our men. Then, like a kraken, huge and black she crushed our ribs in her iron grasp down went the cumberland all a rack with a sudden shudder of death and the cannon's breath for her dying gasp next morn as the sun rose over the bay still floated our flag at the mainmast head lord how beautiful was thy day every waft of the air was a whisper of prayer or a dirge for the dead Oh, brave hearts that went down in the seas, 
ye are at peace in the troubled stream ho oh, brave land with hearts like these thy flag that is rent in twain shall be one again and without a seam snowflakes out of the bosom of the air out of the cloud folds of her garments shaken over the woodlands brown and bare over the harvest fields forsaken silent and soft and slow descends the snow even as our cloudy fancies take suddenly shape in some divine expression even as the troubled heart doth make in the white countenance confession the troubled sky reveals the grief it feels this is the poem of the air slowly in silent syllables recorded this is the secret of despair long in its cloudy bosom hoarded now whispered and revealed to wood and field a day of sunshine o oh, gift of god o oh, perfect day whereon shall no man work but play whereon it is enough for me not to be doing but to be through every fibre of my brain through every nerve through every vein i feel the electric thrill the touch of life that seems almost too much i hear the wind among the trees playing celestial symphonies i see the branches downward bent like keys of some great instrument and over me unrolls on high the splendid scenery of the sky where through a sapphire sea the sun sails like a golden galleon towards yonder cloudland in the west towards yonder islands of the blest whose steep sierra far uplifts its craggy summits white with drifts blow winds and waft through all the rooms the snowflakes of the cherry blooms blow winds and bend within my reach the fiery blossoms of the peach o oh, life and love o oh, happy throng of thoughts whose only speech is song o oh, heart of man canst thou not be blithe as the air is and as free eighteen sixty something left undone labour with what zeal we will something still remains undone something uncompleted still waits the rising of the sun by the bedside on the stair at the threshold near the gates with its menace or its prayer like a mendicant it waits waits and will not go away waits and will not be gainsaid by the cares of yesterday each to-day is heavier made till at length the burden seems greater than our strength can bear heavy as the weight of dreams pressing on us everywhere and we stand from day to day like the dwarfs of times gone by who as the northern legends say on their shoulders held the sky weariness o oh, little feet that such long years must wander on through hopes and fears must ache and bleed beneath your load i nearer to the wayside inn where toil shall cease and rest begin am weary thinking of your road o oh, little hands that weak or strong have still to serve or rule so long have still so long to give or ask i who so much with book and pen have toiled among my fellow-men am weary thinking of your task o oh, little hearts that throb and beat with such impatient feverish heat such limitless and strong desires mine that so long has glowed and burned with passions into ashes turned now covers and conceals its fires o oh, little souls as pure and white and crystalline as rays of light direct from heaven their source divine refracted through the mist of years how red my setting sun appears how lurid looks this soul of mine the end 
The end of section 10 and the end of Tales of a Wayside Inn by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow.